It's another half hour of markets, analysis, and insights on business and corporate life from Channels TV. And here's what's coming up on the program. Kenya set to hold rates after surprise dip in inflation. In South Africa, agriculture exports rise 4% in the third quarter. And Zimbabwe foreign exchange inflows reach $9.44 billion in diaspora remittances. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Will Ibong. Let's kick off as always with market numbers from major equities in Africa where we see trading with mostly negative sentiments. Except for Nigeria, which was up 0.1% at intraday, back to some of the 1,000 uh, level there. And we see South Africa more than half a percent down at intraday. Let's look at Egypt, the EGX, and see how they performed at intraday. There we go. More than also more than half a percent down at intraday. Still at the 25,000 level. And we see Kenya closing Monday session well in the green, is slowly crawling back to that 100, 100 uh, points level that we know it for. Now, let's quickly dig, dive deeper to the NGX and see what's driving stocks yesterday closed in a negative 0.66 percent but today we're seeing that green light spotlighting in that market and we want to know what stocks are really driving this we have samson Wolabi associate research and uh, at zcrest limited is going to give us more insight into this uh, samson is good to have you on the program samson yesterday boa cement mm -hmm was 10% down. It really dragged the market back. We saw that low buy interest in the market also, and sell sets pressure was really up. What are you seeing in the market now? Why is the market in the green? Uh, is, is it still in the green? Because we want to know. Okay, so thank you very much for that. So concerning that, the market is still in the green, and we can see that um, the um, Ocean Index has hedged up to a seven one thousand zero hundred and seventy two point zero three points, and when you look at it, that was still be higher to the seventy thousand points, um, circa seventy thousand points that we saw um yesterday. And um, one of the major drivers is too that you see that um we are at the um, almost at the end of the year, and um during this time, we usually have this one um, thing called the Santa Rally. So during the Santa Rally, we always see investors tend to like you know buy a lot, see a lot of buying interest in the market. So it's something that we are still going to expect more of it um by in this month of December. And when you look at one of the, the major stocks that have been like you know driving the market, you see that there has been a lot of focus on the banking tickers, which is not far fetched based on the fact that you know these tickers are somehow you know quite liquid and also the um, environment currently right now it goes well for them and they've um, released impressive numbers over time. So a lot of analysts are still like giving the buy banking tickers a buyer which is a, a buy recommendation rather so which is one of the major factors that we are seeing why we are seeing um you know um, the buying interest day. And also when you look at some of the penny stocks on the exchange, we have seen um, a lot of like activities and some penny stocks on the exchange. And we've seen a lot of them go significantly as high as um, 600 um, percent year to date returns. And when you look at these factors, you just realize that investors are also, you know, shifting their focus from just like um, the normal um, big um, cap stocks. They're also looking at these penny stocks and um, this stuff is lower cap. And they're trying to look for ways, you know, to just get, um, you know, returns from this talk. So those are the major factors that we've seen drive the market for both the banking tickers. We have seen investors go around um tickers like assets, Zenit, UBA, FBNH, which is first bank. And we've seen first bank doing impressively well over time. We have had some record high currently right now and um they are trading that's around 25.05 um naira. So those are banking tickers, they are still like a buy and we are seeing a lot of like you know buying interest in them. Uh, speaking of petty stocks uh, making great returns in the market, we know that fintech stocks such as Charms and CWG have made like a whole a uh, 800 percent you know gain yet to date so what are you seeing for those stocks uh, at the moment are they still the toast of investors okay so when you look at these stocks when you look at their figures you see that they released them impressive figures and also um from um, you know some um market sources we have seen um some investors also play around all those mark um tickers and when you now look at it you know their prices are quite you know limited very small and when you look at this thing it makes it easier for people to be able to like you know when they see major buying interest it's going to drive their prices up significantly so that is another factor again apart from the fact that they've been releasing um impressive earnings and some investors also have been looking at those stocks just to be able to like you know take profit so those are like the major factors in it because the number of volume that you have to buy for a 
or the large cap stocks to drive their price is not um, is not as the one that you buy for these and small cars. A significant a smaller chunk is going to like drive their prices up. Also, it's one of the major factors we are seeing why their prices have been going up. Just by the fact that, as I've mentioned before, some investors are also looking at these companies to not take profit there, and also the fact that they have been improving, releasing impressive results over time. So those are like the major drivers for these penny stocks. Mm, that's really interesting, especially when there's volume in the market for these penny stocks really drive the prices up. But let's look at what the outlook for today. What do you see it's right now? Is still in the positive? Do you see it closing in the positive or is it going to end up in the red? Yeah, possibly we are going to see positive close because we are currently in a positive session right now. And also the um, sentiment is quite, you know, positive and there's this buying interest also in the market. So we, are, we should possibly see a positive close for today. Okay, we're going to put our fingers crossed for that. Thank you so much, Samson Wolabi Associate Research and Portfolio Manager at Crest Wealth. Thank you for having me once again. Now let's go over to the Middle East, shall we, where it's red at intraday. Abu Dhabi is down 0.47%. Let's look at what divided, also down 0.75%. Elsewhere, we see Saudi and the Qatari indexes also trading down at intraday. Wonder what's going on there, but we'll find out soon <laughs> the close of the bell. Now to the EU, where the readiness of German companies to investors dropped, according to the Munich-based Economic Research Institute, IFO. Uh, most companies responding to its business survey said that they have cut their investment plans until the end of 2024. But joining us to discuss this is Deutsche Welle's correspondent Chiponda Chimbelo in Berlin. Chiponda, what can you tell us about the current investment climate for German companies? Thanks for having me, Will. Well, the Eiffel Institute has said that the investment climate has deteriorated noticeably, and that is due to high financing costs, weak demand, and uncertainty regarding economic policy. Now, most of the economic data that is coming out of Germany hasn't been helpful for investment sentiment. The latest official figures show that exports fell unexpectedly in October, and that was mainly due to weak demand from the rest of the European Union. Germany's exports to other EU countries fell 2.7% in October, and such disappointing economic data is only worsened by the ongoing questions about the German government's budget. The Constitutional Court ruling last month left a 60 billion euro gap in the national budget. So that's something that's put on hold government plans to foster green innovation. And of course, it's not just that. The funding for programs to help companies cope with high energy prices are also in doubt. That's why we are seeing German companies scale back their investment plans. Well, how is the mood playing out for different sectors? Can you tell us? Well, if we start looking at different sectors, well, the mood is most pessimistic in retail, according to the Eiffel Institute. It said companies in manufacturing are the most optimistic, though. The majority of the companies um, in the manufacturing, sur in the manufacturing um, sector that were surveyed uh, said that they intended to invest slightly more this year and the next. But in, the, in that sector, there were also some differences. Manufacturing companies that need significant amounts of energy want to invest less. And when we look at the overall news, we all, of course also need to bear in mind that some are once again calling Germany the sick man of Europe. There are fears about Europe's largest economy and there are fears that it is becoming less attractive to do business. In fact, one in three German companies are said to be planning to shift production abroad, according to Germany's Federation of Industries. And it said that in its supply chain chain pulse check report um, this year. It found that 59% of companies say that energy security and costs are a major reason for German firms to, to actually move abroad and consider investing there. Mm. So what can we expect from markets today? Well, European stocks are expected to be flat. Traders are in a waiting game. U.S. openings data is due later today. Um, last month, we saw hiring figures showing signs of slowing down. A similar trend this month could, of course, be welcome news and a sign that the U.S. Fed will adopt a hawkish policy stance. But it's, of course, not just U.S. jobs data on the radar. Um, there's also PMI services data due for Germany, Spain and the U.K., Thank you so much, Iponda Chimbelu, Deutsche Welle's correspondent there in Berlin, giving us the updates. 
Now we go to the U.S., uh, where stock futures ticked down Tuesday morning after major averages took a break from their latest hot streak. Futures tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average slipped 0.11%. The S&P 500 futures and the Nasdaq 100 futures shed in 0.54 and 0.84% each. Now, during regular trading on Monday, the Nasdaq Composite fell 0.8% as tech companies fell across the board. NVIDIA and Intel declined 2.7% and 3.2% each. Alphabet also shared nearly 2%, while MetaShares lost 1.5%. Now, the pullback came on the back of five consecutive positive weeks for the three major averages. The S&P 500 and the 30 stock Dow slipped 0.5% and 0.1%. Meanwhile, small cap stocks outperformed the rest of the market, with the Russell 2000 posting a 1% gain. The small cap index has enjoyed a nearly 7% gain over the past month, raising hopes of a broadening market rally as in traders become confident that the Federal Reserve will begin to cut rates next year in spite of recent hawkish commentary from the central bank. Now to Asia, where markets fell across board as investors assessed a slew of economic data from across the region. South Korea's overall inflation rate in November fell to 3.3% compared with 3.7% expected by economists. Now, the inflation rate for Japan's capital, Tokyo, came in at 2.6%, down from the 3.3% in October. Saichin and S&P Global also released China's Service Purchasing Managers Index today, which hit a three-month high, while private PMI readings will also be out from Hong Kong and India. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index tumbled 1.91% in its final hour of trade to the lowest since November 2022, leading losses in the region, while the mainland Chinese Shanghai Index fell 1.67%. Now, Japan's Nikkei 225 ended down 1.37%, while the Topics Index was also down 0.84%. In Australia, we'll look at that, the S&P ASX 200 shed 0.89% to close at 7,061 points, as the Reserve Bank of Australia held its benchmark policy rate at 4.35%. Now, in line with expectations, now South Korea's KOSPI also dropped 0.82%. Now on to South Africa, where the electricity minister said over 800,000 South Africans stand to lose their jobs due to load shedding. The minister recently spoke to ESCOM employees at Medupi Power Station, which recently experienced several breakdowns that plunged the company into elevated load shedding levels. The minister estimates that job losses due to elevated load shedding could amount to 860,000 in 2023. And the minister said ESCOM's inability to meet electricity demand reliably is detrimental to the government's ability to help the poor. Energy specialist Chris Yelland attributes this situation to inadequate management at ESCOM. Yelland emphasizes that the consequences are likely to be devastating for employment in South Africa. Let's take a listen. Look, we should be very disturbed that, for example, after 15 years of construction, now Kusili construction started in 2008, it should have been finished in 2015. But after 15 years, today, and this last week, not a single unit at, of the six units at Kusili Power Station is generating electricity into the grid. That is an exceptionally poor performance, and we should be very, very disturbed about that situation. We know that three of those units are units that have been in service that are broken down. Um, the one unit, that's unit number four, is down for some routine maintenance. And units five and six have still not been synchronized to the grid. But remember that it will only be handed over for commercial service in April next year because there's a six-month commissioning period and during that time that unit is not going to be delivering reliable, consistent electricity. It's going to be on and off 
all the time as they do the commissioning tests, which takes about six months. So we can only see that next new unit from Kusili coming on delivering a, a, you know, a stable commercial power by April next year. And the last unit, unit number six, is, uh, is, is only due to be handed over for commercial service in February 2025. So still a long way to go. And after, 20, after 15 years of construction, it is completely unacceptable and out of line with, with any known standard. Hmm. Up next, commodities market update. That is right after the break. Do stay with us. This is Business Incorporated. Thanks for staying with us. Now we'll still continue with South Africa, where its agricultural exports amounted to $3.9 billion in the third quarter, lifting by 4% over a year, and that's according to data from TradeMap. Now, the Agricultural Business Chamber, Agbiz, says this solid export was driven by improvements in volumes and prices. Agbiz adds that products that dominated the export list this quarter were citrus, maize, apples, and pears, nuts, wine, soybeans, sugar, and fruit juices. Overall, South Africa's agricultural exports amounted to $10.2 billion in the first nine months of the year, up 1% from the same period in 2022. Now, and today, we're putting a spotlight on sardines. We're talking commodities now, you know, that canned fish variety. Well, it is widely consumed in Nigeria, but recently, the price of a can of sardines has surged by 60% to 800 naira with some stores selling as high as 900 naira, that's almost a dollar. Uh, let's bring in Victoria Momo, analyst with Financial Derivatives Company, to break it down for us why sardines may soon disappear from our daily consumption. Hi, Victoria. We know inflation is, is in a mix somewhere, but what are the factors are contributing to this rapid price increase? Um, hello, Will. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. So, uh, like you rightly said, sardine, which, you know, was one of the favorite um, canned, you know, fish variety, is slowly phasing out of the tables of many Nigerian homes. And um, I know it's not supposed to be surprising that prices are currently rising across, you know, various food baskets and, you know, various commodities. But we've seen the same um increase in price actually play out in um, um, the price of sardines. So basically, the reason why this price of this price of sardines actually surged by 60% was um, basically due to foreign exchange scarcity, as well as the narrow depreciation. And this is because, you know, almost all, all the sardines that are actually um, consumed here in Nigeria are are imported into the country. And you know, it's no news that the country is currently battling with the issue of um, exchange rates. Uh, you know, the currency has depreciated yet to date by, you know, about 37%. And that is actually weighing on the cost of importation for importers of this particular product. And importers are left with no option but to, you know, transfer this cost burden to the consumers. And that is why we witnessed the spike in price of this particular commodity. And even as apart from that, We've also seen that um, following the policy of um, the exchange rate unification, um, the exchange rate used in computing the import duty has actually been revised upward. So from about 422 Naira per dollar, it's now, uh, you know, about 783 Naira per dollar. So that is, you know, an additional burden for importers. And that is increasing the cost of production, in the cost of importation. And as a result of that, the increase in that cost is actually being filtered into the prices of the um, the commodity but the irony of it all is that i mean recently the cbn actually um you know lifted the ban on 43 items uh you know from accessing foreign exchange and um sardine is actually one of those items but we've not really seen the impact of this reflecting because there is still that issue of forex supply shortage that is hindering you know these importers from getting the forex to actually access this commodity and even if they want to access this commodity you know our exchange rate our exchange rate is currently very weak and particularly the nera at the uh parallel market and that is you know influencing the prices of this particular commodity. Uh, talking of things influencing the prices of sardines, we know that the demand for sardine is widely considered a joint demand. What I mean is it's not consumed as a standalone. You can't just buy sardines and just want to eat them from the can because, you know, you're paired with, you could, for example, bread, 
yams, plantains, and rice. But looking at the other complements of the sardine, we, there's been a significant uptick in their prices. Uh, for instance, the cost of a loaf of bread now is sold to 1,300 naira. We're looking at that, and a 50 kg bag of rice as we also witnessed a substantial increase 15 percent up now is now priced at sixty thousand. Uh, can you explain the concept of this joint demand and uh, why we're seeing this affecting sardines why are they tied together why can't we just separate them so that the prices of these complementary products do not affect the price of sardines uh, so theoretically, um, joint demand is actually a situation whereby two commodities are demanded to um, satisfy a particular need. And then in other words, they are like inter there's this interdependence between the two commodities so much so that uh, the demand for one actually, you know, is directly linked to the demand for the other commodity. So in this case, we've seen that there is like some sort of, um, you know, joint uh, relationship between uh, the demand for sardines and also the complements uh, such as bread and yam. And this is because here in Nigeria, you know, sardine is not, you know, directly consumed, but paired with other complements, like you rightly said, you know, yams and bread. And we've seen significant spikes in uh, the prices of those particular complements, those particular staples. And that is expected to have, you know, an impact in the demand for sardines. Because if uh, the price of bread increases, it affects the demand for the commodity. And then um, sardines is being paired with bread. So if there's a reduction in demand for bread, it affects, you know, the demand for sardine. And do not forget that sardine prices are already rising. And then there is that, you know, demand reduction in demand because of the increase in price. So if all that jointly demanded um, um, staples or commodities are also witnessing increases in prices, it would ha add further pressure to um, the demand for sardines. Um, Victoria, I just, well, I'm at a loss right now because I want to speak for many Nigerians who are heartbroken that they can't eat the sardines they so much love. But in this current inflationary environment and rising unemployment added to that, incomes are being squeezed and consumers are adjusting their spending priorities. Can you just tell us, can you tell you know, consumers out there what they should be doing, are the alternatives? Can they have hope to eat sardines again? Uh, so it is true that um, the environment is inflationary and then we have high level of unemployment and incomes are squeezed, you know, daily due to the rising prices of commodities and not just things but you know commodities in general and as a result of that we've seen like you know consumers trying to reprioritize their spending you know towards necessities or price inelastic commodities in order to just um you know leave basically because you know prices are are on the rise basically so in in that regards we've seen like most of these consumers actually looking what's and in order to meet up with their dietary needs they decided to um, look at other substitutes you know we have the likes of herring fish which is known as um, um this um shower fish and then there is the horse mackerel also known as the kote fish people are looking towards you know frozen fish uh, and that is because okay in terms of that regards we have um increase in quantity like the quantity of the fish that is being bought that is the frozen fish is actually you know way higher than you know a can of sardines so why uh you know spend on a can of sardines to get just two fishes with oil in it and instead of you know going straight to a frozen fish where i can get like you know different pieces of fish and um, different parts of the fish to enjoy so we've seen you know consumers trying to you know look towards that angle in order to um cut down their living expenses and also mm. you know get the best mm. of um, the economic situation and then it's actually not so good for these industries that produce you know sardines because um you know low consumer demand would actually weigh on their profitability mm. and could threaten their mm. existence in that particular market mm. and we've seen that um most of these selling companies are now taking proactive steps to okay. actually, you know, encourage the demand for their products. Okay. I mean, I, I can't remember the last time I saw um, an advert on selling, but recently we've been seeing, you know, selling adverts to 
encourage consumers to mm. consume that particular product. Mm. So I think um, um, the producers or the manufacturers are actually having it um, tough as well as the consumers mm. and everybody's trying to divert um, means to actually, you know, remain in place. Okay, Victoria, I don't know if that ad, well, I, I wish them luck with that because if you look behind me, you'll see that, you know, number of fishes in that can, but that's what we used to have before, but now when you open it, just two... <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Victoria Momo, analyst with Financial Directives, for breaking it down for us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, let's move on to other stories now. Kenya's central bank is likely to leave its benchmark rate unchanged for the third time in a row after a surprise easing in inflation last month. Now, five of six econo economists polled by Bloomberg forecast that the Monetary Policy Committee will maintain borrowing costs at 10.5 percent at its meeting on Tuesday. That's today. Consumer prices, however, rose on an annual 6.8 percent in November, the first time in three months that the rate has declined. Now, in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe has seen a significant rise in foreign exchange inflows, reaching $9.44 billion, and this was boosted by robust growth in diaspora remittances, according to the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. Now, the Monetary Policy Committee, which had this meeting and chaired by the governor, emphasized the critical role of diaspora investments in sustaining Zimbabwe's forex reserves, which have been a primary source since overtaking foreign direct investment in 2009. And the committee has endorsed initiatives to enhance the appeal of diaspora investment through fiscal incentives and has committed to revising interest rates in response to inflation trends. Now, let's remember that yesterday, Zimbabwe's central bank left official interest rates unchanged at 130 percent after its first meeting since the adoption of a new inflation measure to reflect wider U.S. dollar use in the economy. And that's a wrap on Business Incorporated for today. I'm Will Ibong. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.